you could have seen this right here. Separated by 30 years from the precocious child of her own family, facing the greatest challenge of her life, From the earliest times in Japan, many highly skilled swordsmiths have forged extremely fine swords. Today, since swords are no longer used as weapons, modern-day swordsmiths are respected as artisans. This is the shop of swordsmith Miyari Shohei, who lives in Nagano Prefecture. His students are producing bundles of straw, which are burned to create ashes. This is a necessary process in the forging of a sword blade. Students have many preparations to complete before the actual forging of a sword blade. One of Mr. Miyari's preparations is to break apart old iron kettles, which he has bought and gathered from antique shops in Nara. Old iron kettles were made of good sand iron, and this is a very good ingredient for the Japanese sword. The material used for a Japanese sword is specially chosen. Some swordsmiths gather old temple nails as well for their swords. The fragments of the iron kettle are gathered and melted over a charcoal fire. This process of resmelting the steel is called wakasu. And the steel end product of this process is called orishigane. This process is a simple refinement for the making of swords. Mr. Miyari's family has a tradition of smithing since his grandfather's time. Mr. Miyari dedicated himself to becoming a swordsmith in 1935. By the time Mr. Miyari advanced to becoming an independent swordsmith, Japan was in the midst of World War II. During this time period, many swordsmiths started making cheap army swords called gunto. Although it was a difficult time to make a living, Mr. Miyari continued to strive toward making quality swords. Today in Japan, there are approximately 200 swordsmiths, of which Mr. Miyari is ranked amongst the top. Without good steel, a good sword cannot be made. Blocks of steel made from the scrap kettles are broken again and stacked. It is then remelted before actually starting the forging process. It is first wrapped in rice paper. The steel is then covered with mud in order to prevent it from toppling. The ashes are sprinkled over the mud in the belief that this acted as a flux and prevented oxidation. This long-handled platform upon which the iron is put is called a teiko. The teiko was made from a high-quality steel drawn from sand, a steel called tamahagane. This high-quality steel is rare today, so Mr. Miyari uses the special steel which he bought before the war very sparingly. The swordsmith's work begins at 5 a.m. every day. The three students are rhythmically hammering with Mr. Miyari using the small hammer to lead the student's pace and speed and force. Mr. Miyari stated, concentration is needed in leading the three students, for if there is not precise timing, a good sword cannot be made.
三人を相手にするときはよほど気持ちを引き締めないと呼吸が合わず思ったようにうまく鍛えられないと宮入さんは語っていましたミスター・ミヤリ uses the bellows called fuego to force air into the forge This controls the amount of heat which determines the hardness of the steel. The seat near the bellows is the side seat called Yokoza. Here the most skilled worker sits, which shows the importance and difficulties of manipulating the bellows. Making the sword requires many different kinds of steel. The preparation of steel is called shitagate, or foundation forging. The outside laminations of the blade are called kawagane, or skin steel. A Japanese sword is required to be unbreakable, unbendable, and sharp. In order to forge this sword, besides skin steel, A shigane or center soft steel is needed to be mixed with a special tamahagane steel. The hardest steel is used to make the sword's edge. Three types of steel are put together to make the blade. The skin steel is folded from different sides alternately to ultimately become the sword surface. The intrinsic essence of a Japanese blade is sharpness and beauty. Both are needed for perfection in a Japanese sword, and unique methods are devised by skilled swordsmiths as ways to satisfy the demand for both. The oro shigane is extended and cut into equal pieces. This part of the sword has been forged 18 times. The tamahagane, or special steel, has been forged 10 times and is piled together. The same process is done with the shigane, or soft center steel. All of this takes a very long time. Fuigo Matsuri, a holiday in honor of the bellows, has been celebrated on November 8th every year by all the swordsmiths in Japan since the earliest of times. More than just a formality, he wants to make a better sword. This does not have any religious significance. Rather, he wants to show thanks to Fugyo, the bellows, which he uses all year long. He offers small portions of food to the bellows to give thanks. This holiday is celebrated by the swordsmith's family and his students by feasting on rice and red beans. The swordsmith's wife is also most happy on this day, and the holiday is a welcome rest for the students who work very hard cutting charcoal and burning straw all day. Serious swordsmiths like Mr. Miyari have only recently been able to make a living by making swords. Up until two or three years ago, he only made hoes and sickles to make a living. 
Mr. Miyari is usually covered in ashes, working from morning till night. But today he takes his children to enjoy the Chikuma River and to the mountains to pick persimmons, which he says he enjoys. Cutting charcoal like this is what the students do most. Cutting charcoal all day occupies the majority of the students' time. The charcoal they are working with right now is made by themselves from the pine trees that the students had cut down and brought from the nearby mountains. Now we come to the start of the actual sword forging called Tsukuribikami. The Shigane and Hanokane and the Kawagane on each side is assembled and bound together. It is then forged and heated into one piece. This process takes many heatings and forging until the smith is fully satisfied that all the steel is well adhered to each other. This block is extended by hammering. This process is called tsunobi, or rough extension. In this process, there is no further addition of steel or folding. Extending the sword in this manner and keeping the thickness even is quite difficult. その部の時には右手いる手こに印をつけ刃の側と右の側とを間違えないようにします。夢中になって何度もひっくり返しながら伸ばしていくうちにどちらが刃の側かわからなくなってしまう恐れがあるから。A mark is put onto the handle to indicate the edge size versus the back side so that there is no chance of a mistake during the rapid pace. When the metal is fully extended to a sword size, it is cut off at the handle. The sword is then forged from the handle to the tip. When the smith gets to the tip, he makes a diagonal cut and forges the point called the Boshi Zukuri. With the repeated heatings and forging of the steel, the edge is gradually thinned. The bar steel is brought to its rough sword shape by solely using the hammer, called the Kozuchi, and the anvil, called the Kanatoko, a process learned only from much experience. This work is called Hizukuri. From the beginning to this point in the process usually takes 15 days to make one sword. The sword is further refined with a file called Yasuri and a draw shape called Sen, which brings out the first gleam of metal from the black color of the sword. The file and draw shape were made by Mr. Mariyagi because store-bought tools were out too quickly. After exposing the sword, Mr. Miyari washes it in Aku. Using a spatula he made himself, Mr. Miyari applies a coat of fireproof clay called Yakibasuchi onto the sword, a clay that he made himself. Where he wants tempering, he applies a light coating. Where he does not want tempering, he coats thickly. All this is done very delicately. The temper line or hamon appears at the junction of the two coats and its application is very important. The spatula is important in determining the thickness of the mud. They do this to give the temper a delicate and effable quality.
The beauty of the timberline is very important in the characteristics of the Japanese blade. There are two general types of timberlines. One is wavy, called midariba. The other is straight, called suguha. Timberlines are determined by the coating of the clay. Now comes the hardening of the edge, called the yakiri. Setting the temper is done in a dark room in the evening when the color of the fire can be observed. The fire is properly heated. Then the critical moment in which the blade can come out good or be ruined. This is the hardening. The temperature of the fire and the temperature of the water into which the sword is plunged is a closely guarded secret of each smith. Any warping or correction of curvature is taken care of and the smith does a rough grinding called kajitori to expose any flaws. The tang is finished and a pattern of file marks is added. By examining the file marks, one can determine when it was made, its style, and also by whom it was made. The hole for the handle peg is punched and the blade is sent to the polisher. Mr. Fujishiro is a professional polisher who has been at his trade for 30 years and his father before him. The beauty of the sword depends greatly upon the work of the polisher and now that a sword is considered a work of art, the polisher's skill is more greatly appreciated. Curvature in the Japanese sword started in the Heian era. In the Kamakura era, all samurai, or bushi, had to have a sword. Swordsmiths became popular and many famous swordsmiths emerged. Many old blades with their smith signature still remain. After approving the work of the blade, Mr. Miyari engraves his signature onto the tang. Mr. Miyari states, my object in making swords is not to produce a weapon for killing, but rather to perpetuate an art form that results in great beauty. I would like people to appreciate the Japanese sword for its character and for the beauty of its simplicity.